I'll be talking today about management of idiopathic hypersomnia. And again, I am a child neurologist and sleep physician. I do see patients until age 25, so have some experience with the young adult population, but um, we'll try to kind of cover both adult and pediatric management. Um, these are my disclosures, and I will be talking about medications from some of these groups, including Jazz Pharmaceuticals and Harmony Biosciences, um, but I hope I'm presenting a balanced view. Um, I don't have to tell this group um, sort of the background of idiopathic hypersomnia, but just to kind of point out that idiopathic hypersomnia is, is well beyond just excessive daytime sleepiness. And some patients really struggle with some of the other symptoms, such as prolonged sleep duration, sleep inertia, sleep drunkenness, brain fog, and very crippling fatigue. And so as I kind of go through the management, um, I think, you know, daytime sleepiness is sort of the, the outcome measure that a lot of these studies get um, based around and whether it's a successful study or not. But I think as Claire mentioned, that Illuminate um, study that's ongoing is really an important opportunity to kind of voice the other symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia that might be really functionally limiting. Um, we know that the incidence and prevalence of idiopathic hypersomnia is, is relatively unknown, um, but, but it is something that seems to be increasing in frequency even in our clinics. Um, symptom onset usually is in early um, uh, adulthood, so between the ages of 15 and 25 years is one peak, and at least it's more commonly reported by Caucasian females, although there might be biases in who read, who's in registries and answers surveys. Interestingly, there's oftentimes a family member who has hypersomnia of some type, um, and that sort of can be helpful in terms of making the diagnoses. Um, the, the condition in itself is dependent on um, excluding other causes of idiopath of, of hypersomnia. So uh, a normal neurologic exam at the least is recommended. Um, and interestingly, about 25% of patients, at least in retrospective studies, quote unquote, outgrow the condition. And that really is something that we need more information about, um, highlighting the need for sort of longitudinal prospective studies. And I think here, um, the, the issue we have in the medical community and probably as patients that you guys have experienced is really how do we define idiopathic hypersomnia? Where does narcolepsy end and idiopathic hypersomnia begin? And probably this is a, sort of a spectrum condition in the sense that narcolepsy type 1 is you know, this condition of narcolepsy with cataplexy, narcolepsy type 2 is narcolepsy without cataplexy, and then idiopathic hypersomnia. And in many cases, the symptoms overlap. And in patients who have uh, severe daytime sleepiness, they can sometimes have sleep paralysis and hypnagogic hallucinations similar to narcolepsy type 2. So that grouping of idiopathic hypersomnia with normal sleep duration essentially sometimes can overlap with narcolepsy type 2 or narcolepsy without cataplexy. Um, however, many people with narcolepsy, or I'm sorry, with idiopathic hypersomnia have long sleep duration. And that is where we kind of struggle as a clinical community as to what are the best tests for making the diagnosis. Is it this polysomnogram and daytime multiple sleep latency study that we apply for narcolepsy? Or are there better tests to kind of capture that long sleep duration? And at least based on billing data, um, almost 69% of idiopathic hypersomnia patients do have this long sleep time phenotype. So it's not a trivial issue if the majority of the population um, has this. And this is, I think, would be great to get some feedback on that. Um, I think this might be a little too much for this audience, but essentially the diagnostic criteria is based on the what's called the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, and there were some recent revisions. Um, these revisions really didn't impact the diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. It still requires um, the need for daytime sleepiness that's chronic in nature. There can't be cataplexy, otherwise we'd be thinking more of narcolepsy with cataplexy. 
essentially the blue represents some changes in verbiage um, in the diagnostic criteria, basically just saying it can't be narcolepsy type 1 or type 2 to be idiopathic hypersomnia or the features on those diagnostic sleep studies can't be supportive of that. Um, many of people in the audience probably have had a multiple sleep latency test. We call that an MSLT. So uh, there's a few ways of making the diagnosis, essentially. One is to have an MSLT, this NAP study, that shows that you have very severe daytime sleepiness objectively by this eight-minute cutoff. Another is to do a 24-hour polysomnogram to try to capture that long sleep duration. In this case, the cutoff is over 11 hours. Um, or you can do actigraphy where you capture that habitual long sleep duration over a, at least a seven-week period. And then the last F is just ruling out other causes. So this might look familiar if, if you've gone through any of these experiences. In actigraphy, we're just basically trying to capture the sleep duration on the MSLT, we're trying to see how sleepy people are across five nap periods. And then on an extended polysomnogram, if we're able to do that, because that does require a lot of resources and, and pretty rarely available, I think, in most sleep labs. But when we are able to do it, we're trying to capture this very long sleep duration um, that meets the clinical criteria. So I say all this because in the end, idiopathic hypersomnia is a pretty heterogeneous condition where some patients are very sleepy and again overlap with narcolepsy in that severity and some might have more mild sleepiness but long sleep duration and might have you know slightly different constellation of symptoms and this is something that affects diagnosis because if only a small portion of people with idiopathic hypersomnia have the severity of sleepiness as narcolepsy patients there's one really big issue because most people are using the MSLT for the diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. And so this um, has come up through work from Lynn Marie Trotti and Chad Ruoff, basically highlighting the issue that only 25% of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, when you repeat the test, will still have idiopathic hypersomnia. So again, it's sort of opening this conversation for are there better tests that we should be doing for patients who might have more variable daytime sleepiness, but more chronic um, long sleep time and sleep inertia? And what do those tests look like? And are, are they feasible in, in, a, in, in most North American sleep labs? So moving on to medications and management, um, I guess the first thing is there's currently no treatments approved for idiopathic hypersomnia for child, for people under 18 years of age that's been approved by the FDA. So that always leaves pediatrics a little bit in a lurch, and we're oftentimes using medications off-label um, that might have been approved for adults or just off-label altogether. Um, in terms of the medications that I'll review, I, as Matt sort of mentioned, I was one of the chairs for the American Academy uh, a sleep medicine practice parameters um, for the treatment of hypersomnia disorders. So um, the things that have a star next to it were things that we actually had reviewed um, in that um, report and gave either uh, a recommendation that was strong for use, that something that might apply to everybody, or a, what we call a weak or conditional recommendation that might apply to a fewer people or more data might be necessary to make a stronger recommendation. So to that end, um, traditional stimulants, so things like methylphenidate, uh, amphetamines, are very commonly used for the treatment of daytime sleepiness. We know that they come in short and fast-acting formulations, and that might be helpful for sleep inertia if taken first thing in the morning. Um, versus patients who have long-standing daytime sleepiness um, and sleep inertia might still be an issue, but the, their problem is more falling asleep through the day. In those cases, long-acting might be helpful. I think um, many people might have this experience, but sleep inertia might sometimes be the most significant symptom for some patients. And here there's some formulations of methylphenidate that interestingly peak in the morning if it's taken at nighttime. So medications like Journay, if you're not if you're familiar with that brand name, are taken at bedtime with the idea that the peak onset is actually first thing in the morning. 
and potentially can help with um, that sleep inertia feeling. So that medication in particular is only uh, approved FDA-wise for, for ADHD, but again, used off-label for some of the symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia. So things to monitor for with stimulants would be mood exacerbations, and I'll mention this later, that mood disorders are very common in the idiopathic hypersomnia population, and sometimes um, the stimulants are so aggravating to mood that it's basically not something that we can use. And to that end, suicidal ideation is a potential thing that needs to be monitored for, and it can certainly increase blood pressure and heart rate. Um, moving on, modafinil and armodafinil, um, as opposed to methylphenidate, amphetamine, or these traditional stimulants that probably increase dopamine and to some degrees, norepinephrine, we think modafinil um, and armodafinil probably work more through the dopamine system alone. This is also only FDA approved for 17 years of age, um, and that's because there's been some rare cases of Steven Johnson and psychosis with use in the pediatric population. Um, this medication too is helpful for daytime sleepiness, and there's at least some um, open label and uh, clinical trial data um, supporting its use. So based on that, it did receive a strong recommendation for use for the treatment of daytime sleepiness with idiopathic hypersomnia from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine practice parameters. Um, this is something that has the potential to have a drug-drug interaction with hormonal contraceptives. So females who are on oral contraceptives for birth control, for instance, need to be really cautioned about usage um, with this medication and use barrier protection in addition um, to that therapy. Um, things to monitor, again, would be very similar to traditional stimulants, mood, suicidal ideations, blood pressure, as well as rash. Um, I would say the frequency of side effects is lesser than traditional stimulants, but still there. A medication that was also uh, reviewed in the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, practice parameters was sodium oxabate or Zyrem. Um, now that, when we reviewed it, um, this was before a recent clinical trial um, that used low uh, salt oxabate for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia, which I'll review in a second. But based on the original uh, data before that clinical trial, it did receive a conditional recommendation for use in IH. Um, the, this is a, if you're not familiar, this is a very potent sedative medication that's taken at nighttime uh, for the treatment. It initially was approved for narcolepsy. And for reasons we think that perhaps there might be a lack of restorative sleep, and also based on observational studies that Oxabate actually helped patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, it launched into this um, clinical trial to consider low salt oxabate for idiopathic hypersomnia. It's typically dosed twice nightly, but um, in the clinical trial, it was used once a night as well. Um, and it was very, it proved to be beneficial, as I'll show you in a second, uh, for the primary outcomes of reducing daytime sleepiness, but also other important um, uh, symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia, including sleep inertia and even potentially reducing long sleep duration. However, it is part of the REM safety program, um, risk mitigation program, because there are some serious potential uh, issues with oxabate, such as if it was taken with alcohol or other sedating substances that could lead to respiratory depression and death, um, and close monitoring is needed for conditions like mood disorders and sleep disordered breathing. And I'll review the data for that in, in just a second. More recently, there was um, a study of pitolisant, and pitolisant is a medication that works through the histamine system. So you know um, antihistamines basically make you drowsy. Well, there's central nervous system, histamine in the brain, and that's an awake-producing neurotransmitter. So this medication is functionally trying to increase the histamine in the brain for wake promotion. And there was a recent phase three clinical trial called the Intune study. This was a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized withdrawal study. It hasn't been published yet. And so this is just based off of the company's press release. But um, it sounds like they did not meet their primary outcome of improving daytime sleepiness during the withdrawal phase. 
However, their press release uh, does hint of favorable outcomes in the open label phase, um, and it describes it as safe and tolerable, con um, similar to other published data. So I think we just need more information there, but hopefully a promising therapy. So going back to the evidence for the lower salt oxabate, and I, I wanted to highlight this study because you know it's one of the few randomized controlled studies we have in idiopathic hypersomnia. This was a study that was published in Lancet Neurology in 2022. It included adults with idiopathic hypersomnia, 18 to 75. And importantly, it included patients not just with the MSLT um, less than eight minutes um, phenotype, but also patients who also had long sleep duration um, in, in the here. So it included 56 patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, and then there were 59 patients that were randomized to the, the withdrawal placebo condition. Most patients were in their 30s to 40s, and the intervention was um, low salt oxabate, which is abbreviated as LXB, and it was either used um, at maximum 4.5 grams twice nightly, or as I mentioned before, just as a single dose at bedtime up to a dose of six grams. And the outcomes they used, I think, will be uh, appreciated by this audience, um, not just the daytime sleepiness upward scale, but also um, a scale of idiopathic hypersomnia severity, um, patient and clinical impression scales, how well do you think your condition improved, essentially, based off patient input, as well as the clinicians, functional outcomes of sleep, so that looks at things like sleepiness and fatigue, um, sleep inertia, which was based off a of visual scale, and work productivity and activity impairment. So I wanted to just review this trial um, design because I think it's a little different than what other people uh, might know about clinical trials. Uh, withdrawal studies are becoming more and more common um, as, a, as, as a method of how to uh, test drugs. And here, what you're doing is essentially, the, in this study, they took patients who are on sodium oxabate already, on alerting drugs, or who never were on any medications. If they were on sodium oxabate, they changed them over to the low salt oxabate. And then during this type of study, there's an open label titration, meaning that you're increasing the amount of oxabate until you reach a, a beneficial effect. Once you reach that dose, there's a stable period of oxabate use. And then the, the withdrawal phase is then patients are randomized to either stay on the sodium, or I'm sorry, the low sodium oxabate or randomized to placebo. So that's considered the withdrawal phase. And that goes on for two weeks. And then um, there's an open label extension. If people want to continue on the oxabate, they can. And then there's a safety follow-up. So this is a, you know, again, as I mentioned before, a more common study design. And the advantage of such a design is that everybody gets uh, a period of time on the study intervention. Um, so that might be considered a benefit. And then potentially you can minimize the time that some, some patients would be random or uh, participants would be randomized to placebo. So in this um, study trial, they showed that um, with the oxabate use, there was a significant improvement in daytime sleepiness. So this is the end of the um, stable dosing. So you can see over the course of the weeks, there was um, steady improvement in daytime sleepiness. And at the end of the withdrawal phase, the people who continued on the oxabate stayed pretty um, stable in terms of their daytime sleepiness control versus those who were randomized to placebo had a substantial increase in their daytime sleepiness as measured by um, the oxabate, I'm sorry, as measured by the Epworth score. And that's uh, that result was statistically significant. Um, and so they had other outcomes, as I mentioned. So other outcomes that improved included improvements in the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale, global impression scale based off the patients as well as the clinicians, um, sleep inertia improved, the percent of time that um, people said that they missed at work um, was higher in the placebo group, 
and the overall number of uh, percent of activity missed due to idiopathic hypersomnia um, symptoms was higher in the placebo group compared to the oxabate group. So I think that all of those results were statistically significant, which is wonderful, of course, but I think um, the important things, these are important measures, I think, to the function of most patients. However, there were side effects of the medication that should be reported. So 80% um, of participants in this clinical trial reported that they experienced some side effect, um, and those included most commonly nausea, headache, dizziness, anxiety, uh, loss of appetite. Fortunately, there were no serious um, adverse effects in this. Uh, the study discontinuation rate was 17%. And people stopped the medication or uh, the oxabate because of anxiety, insomnia, nausea, confusion, or paresthesias. So this is busy, but I'll just um, kind of go through this quickly. So in addition, um, these are treatments that have been um, used and studied for for idiopathic hypersomnia based on a hypothesis that idiopathic hypersomnia is due to this endogenous substance that might increase um, GABA receptor activity. So GABA is a neurotransmitter in our brains that sort of promotes sleepiness and sleep. And so the idea has been shown uh, in, in, in different studies that um, patients with hypersomnia disorders, including idiopathic hypersomnia, have sort of a heightened sensitivity to, to GABA. So as a result, um, various formulations of medications, including clarithromycin, which is an antibiotic that modulates the function of GABA receptors, and flumazenil, which is uh, a basically a negative modulator of these GABA receptors, um, have been tested for idiopathic hypersomnia, with most of this work being done at Emory. In a pilot study for clinical uh, trials, uh, clarithromycin was tested, and this um, trial included hypersomnia patients. I think it was 50-some hypersomnia patients, but within that, um, 10 of those patients had idiopathic hypersomnia. And um, of those 10, there was a reduced sleepiness with use of clarithromycin compared to placebo by three about three points, and there was also measured improvement in both quality of life and fatigue. There weren't improvements in the objective um, outcome of psychomotor vigilance tests with the objective test. Um, and side effects of the medication included GI upset and sort of um, dyscusia, so it, uh, altered taste essentially. But there were no serious side effects, which is good because in the literature, there are um, more serious side effects reported just in general with clarithromycin use including the risk of antibiotic um, resistance, QT prolongation, and there's been a reported higher incidence of um, uh, cardiac issues in patients who are predisposed. Flumazenil um, was studied also as a, um, not as a placebo-controlled study, but an open-label study, meaning that people were prescribed the medication and they assessed the um, response to the treatment pre-post intervention and looked at side effects. So here um, of patients, the 36 patients who were studied, um, flumazenil reported um, improvement in disease severity was about 24%. And side effects of the medication were mild for most patients, dizziness, mood changes, headaches, weight change, taste change, dry mouth, and abdominal pain. Um, there were two serious events in this study. One was transient ischemic attack and one was lupus vasculopathy. However, these are patients who had underlying um, conditions that might predispose these, and it's unknown if um, these more serious adverse effects were really related to drug itself. And then the last one I wanted to talk to you about was this new um, publication, which was looking at a single infusion of Dina Varexton. Um, which is essentially an orexin agonist that's um, currently in development for treatment of it, narcolepsy. Um, however, it's a small molecule that is fundamental for wake promotion. 
So here, the study group is testing whether this wake-promoting neuropeptide could be helpful for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. And this wasn't a pill. This was an IV formulation of, of, a of this medication that is delivered over a nine-hour period. So in this study, it was a smaller study, just looking at just a looking for any evidence of efficacy as well as safety issues. And here patients um, 18 to 75 were tested. They were randomized um, to either placebo control um, versus, and then they were crossed over. So if they started on placebo in the second um, day after washout, they were on, on study drug. So everybody sort of got some exposure to the study drug essentially. Um, and the safety assessments they were looking at were um, the multiple or the maintenance of wakefulness test. So this is a test, uh, an objective test of how long can you stay awake over a 40 minute period without any stimulation um, and a sleepiness scale that measures sort of momentary sleepiness. And then the psychomotor vigilant test, which is an objective test to measure vigilance. So of this 27 um, patients who received the study drug, um, two discontinued after they were on placebo. Um, but um, there was improvement in the main outcomes on the um, maintenance wakeful test. So in blue is the patients that were on the Danavorexin, and in green is the placebo. So on the um, MWT, uh, the patients who are on the intervention could stay awake much longer, almost to a normal degree. Um, patients on, on the study intervention had reductions in daytime sleepiness by nearly 50%. And um, those that were on the intervention also had improvements on the psychomotor vigilant tasks with all of the results being significant. 44% of patients did report having a treatment adverse um, reaction and 37% considered it probably related to the study drug. Um, but overall, the conclusion from this study was that these orexin-2 receptor agonists show great promise for the treatment of adults with idiopathic hypersomnia. And in terms of the adverse effects, just to kind of delve into that a little bit more, um, the treatment emergent effects um, for the majority of people was felt to be mild um, with headache, um, polycuria means uh, changes in urination. So interestingly, as these studies have been um, tested both in narcolepsy as well as in, in idiopathic hypersomnia, we're learning that there must be orexin receptors in the ponds where the, the micturation centers are. So increased urination, um, increased frequency or the urge to go has been reported across these studies. Um, dizziness and rhinorrhea, um, meaning runny nose, were also reported. And I think there were some changes in things like um, blood pressure, as well as um, some EKG changes, but they were also reported in the placebo group, and it sort of makes it difficult to know if it's truly drug-related. So last, I think this is a really critical slide. We talked all about the various medication options right now, but I think non-pharmacologic management is a must um, for any hypersomnia condition. In specific to idiopathic hypersomnia, uh, you know, the one of the most profound symptoms, as I've mentioned a few times now, is the sleep inertia. And so patients oftentimes need multiple alarms or other sort of systems to get them up in the morning to get going. Um, naps, which we oftentimes counsel for the use of narcolepsy patients, might not be so helpful for idiopathic hypersomnia patients. Many of my patients report they're not helpful because they just can't get out of the sleep period. They don't find the naps to be restorative, and they actually feel worse upon wakening. So that's, you know, it's always um, person dependent. If someone reports that it's helpful, great, make it part of their behavioral plan. Um, but if it's not, we don't try to push on that. If sleep inertia or difficulty wakings are really the problem, as much as possible, we try to structure classrooms such that there might be a study hall period or something that could be missed first thing in the morning. Um, delayed start times of things like meetings or work times could be also helpful. 
if people are sleepy during the day or have really severe fatigue, extra test time um, or stop the clock breaks on time tests is really important. Extra time in general to complete projects and homework is usually recommended. And if people are struggling with daytime sleepiness and fatigue, just small things can sometimes make a difference, such as being able to keep cold water with them, take movement breaks, chew gum in class, or have fidget toys. Um, you know, we don't over encourage excuse absences for this, but if someone really could not get to school or work because of their um, disease symptoms, that's something that we will put in their 504 or accommodations plan. I'm seeing more and more requests for accommodations for brain fog, which is oftentimes reported in idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and that's something that, you know, we we will try to do. Um, what that really means is just extra time for, for tests or extra time to complete homework. There's a whole evolution of cognitive behavior therapy that includes hypersomnia, that focuses on behavioral strategies to improve symptoms, um, helping with coping, um, how to manage stigma, and how to become more of a self-advocate. And I think we can't um, underestimate the importance of psychosocial support like groups like this, um, as well as just you know finding another patient and, and trying to connect. Um, it really is fundamentally important. Oftentimes, these are rare conditions and people don't have that um, support group around them. And that can be really important to kind of share ideas for management as well as provide that support. The comorbidities of idiopathic hypersomnia are broad um, and include depression, anxiety, which can affect nearly a third of people, autonomic disorders, including orthostasis or positional orthostatic tachycardia can sometimes make management really difficult. Um, obesity has been reported, diabetes, hypertension, other cardiovascular diseases, hyperlipidemia, and obstructive sleep apnea, perhaps because of the weight gain, um, are all commonly reported. So a lot of the times we're trying to make sure that something like obstructive sleep apnea hasn't just developed during the time we're managing patients, making symptoms worse. Um, I think we have to always be mindful of the cardiovascular issues that might be coming up here um, and try to limit the things like um, stimulants that can certainly worsen hypertension. So in conclusion, I think, you know, when we're assessing patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, um, as clinicians, we try to allow the patient <laughs> to tell us what's the most important symptoms that need to be treated because as you sort of saw, there's a focus on daytime sleepiness in these clinical trials, and it's a measurable symptom, at least easily by say the Epworth sleepiness score, we sort of might focus on just daytime sleepiness. But I think here as patients and self-advocates, it's important to sort of communicate what's important to you. It might be fatigue and not sleepiness. It might be sleep inertia or long sleep times. Um, and those are things that might not improve with treatments that were formulated for just daytime sleepiness. Um, medications alone, as I mentioned, are really not going to be sufficient enough. So thinking more broadly about what your needs are, support groups, psychological support, additional accommodations are important things to bring up to your healthcare provider. And then as you're seeing, there are more treatments available and promising therapies on the horizon for idiopathic hypersomnia. I think um, to what Claire mentioned, um, participating in FDA reviews to basically highlight where the gaps in treatments are for idiopathic hypersomnia is really important to do as a group. Um, but also when there are clinical trials, research participation is really critical so that there can be that benefit of expanding therapeutic options. And I'll leave it at there and take some questions. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Maskey, I want to be considerate of your time. Is there a time frame that you have that you have for questions? Um, I'm sure we would probably have 30 minutes worth, but I don't. I want to make sure that we are uh, considerate of you and your family. So, just let me know how long you think would be, and I'll make sure that no, we stick can, to that. It can stay for another 10, 15 minutes. Okay, very good. Um, so, the best format with this is going to be to put your questions in the chat. Um, I think that with a group this size, that will make sure that we get get to all the questions. If you can try to keep the questions focused on broad topics versus I took this medication and it didn't work, um, you know that way Dr. Massey can talk broadly about 
you know, the medications or the treatments that are available. Just to, while people are putting things in the chat, I just wanted to applaud you for including social support and apps, um, you know, tr therapeutics that are outside of the medication um, continuum that, that are essential for all of us. Um, and then also, you know, I, I was going to ask about the erection receptor agonist. You did a great job covering that and um, just really excited to see the direction that that's going and um, hopefully to, to have a therapy for, for this population, I think would be fantastic. So I do see a question that popped up. Um, can you speak more of outgrowing IH? Um, I've never heard of that. Um, so I guess that would be specifically talking about possible remission um, cases. Yeah, I and mean, then, we don't know a lot about it um, because there, like, as I mentioned, there's really not longitudinal studies of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia to know. And then also it's not clear maybe how patients were diagnosed if they, if they had say depression, for instance, with sleepiness, um, that could be a condition that would be more likely to be outgrown. Um, but that all that being said, I, I think that's really promising <laughs> that, you know, uh, at least a, a good chunk of patients do feel like their symptoms get better with age. Um, I think it just is something that requires closer study though. Yeah, and I know you mentioned the challenge of replicating study data too. So I imagine there's, you know, some making sure that there's consistency in the diagnosis uh, with the tools that are available. Um, let's see, but is there a medication that you recommend for, or that doctors recommend for sleep inertia? I know you mentioned Jordan APM um, as one option, um, but is there something that you um, or your peers look to as kind of like a go-to to help people with sleep inertia or perhaps a, a taking of medication? If anyone has a um, absolute medication, I think that people try different things, including the Journey PM. Um, other medications are just use of short um, acting stimulants. You know, short acting stimulants usually work within 30 minutes. So we have patients take that first thing in the morning. Sometimes they might even take it you know, they'll set an alarm 30 minutes before the desired wake time, take the medication, go back to sleep, and then sort of the peak onset can help them with waking in the morning. Um, I've, I've heard of people using extend release um, stimulants um, other than Journey PM, like just Adderall XR at bedtime and, and that helping. I've had mixed results with that. Um, I think the low salt oxabate was one of the few studies that actually showed an improvement um, in a clinical trial compared to placebo, um, specifically with sleep inertia improvement, which is promising. So yeah, we don't really have like a specific drug. And, you know, if, if others in the community have other um, things that have helped, I think that would be um, useful to discuss. But yeah. Yeah, that's something we can definitely dive into when it comes to the discussion group strategies to taking medications, I think will be a, a really good topic for the discussion groups. Um, Quinn put an article um, in the chat related to sleep inertia. I encourage everybody to take a look at that as well. Um, there's been a couple of questions coming through. Um, as I anticipated, there's quite a few questions coming in, but I see um, two questions related to um, lupus and other comorbid conditions. Um, is there anything definitive connections that you mentioned a few comorbidities have you read anything in relationship to lupus um and ih um so just wanted to touch base on that yeah i mean i think in general hypersomnia is is a pretty broad condition and we certainly see it in many medical neurologic and psychiatric conditions um so it's always hard like you know with with especially with psychiatric conditions is it primary ih or is it primary mood disorder with hypersomnia but at least in lupus in specific we know that a lot of conditions that have inflammatory um, components can produce hypersomnia and oftentimes we're simply using the same management strategies as we do with um, idiopathic hypersomnia or other uh, hypersomnia disorders like narcolepsy Thank you. Um, here's a question I think that, that has a lot of application too. Is fatigue often associated with IH? Um, I've seen some pretty mixed responses in different support groups, um, or is it some other com comorbidity? I know there's some 
differences in fatigue and sleepiness, but I'd be very interested to hear your take in terms of fatigue and specifics to, to, to IH as a condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, in my experience, yes, fatigue is very common in idiopathic hypersomnia, as it is in narcolepsy. I think um, the issue is that, you know, sleepiness is really this state where people um, cannot stay awake. So there's lapses into sleep and whatever. Whereas fatigue is just that feeling of tiredness, like, you know, feeling unrefreshed when you wake up and dragging all day. But if you ask people who are really tired, sometimes they just can't sleep, like they can't nap. So it sort of differentiates from sleepiness. And fatigue is harder to treat. You know, we don't even really know what fatigue is. Is it a brain-based problem? Is it a, you know, autonomic problem? We really just don't know. Um, so in my experience, yeah, it is certainly a, a major issue. And oftentimes in these conditions I mentioned, we can treat the sleepiness, meaning um, they're not, patients aren't falling asleep anymore, but they still have that fatigue despite the treatments. And so I think that's really the challenging part we have is like better treatments that address um, that, that fatigue. Yeah, I know just from personal experience, making sure that I have the, the physician looks me over as a whole, you know, there could be something else. I had some blood sugar issues that needed to be addressed. Um, you know, there's hormonal deficiencies that can result in fatigue as well. So definitely, I, I think it can be a part of, but also independent of, you know, or, or both at the same time. There's been a few questions too about, um, in, in particular relationship to COVID and possibly the worsening of symptoms or, or possibly COVID as a um, as a trigger for the onset of IH. So just wanted to, to open that. I know that's a, a pretty loaded question with a whole lot of research still kind of in its infancy, but I would love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, well, to the exacerbation question, I think we don't know. It certainly would make sense, um, you know, that it potentially could just given the associations with long COVID and um, fatigue and sleepiness um, being reported in that population. So I would imagine, yes, it probably could exacerbate symptoms. Um, I can speak more to the narcolepsy population when our narcolepsy population went through the COVID um, explosion. You know, essentially everybody's symptoms got worse, but it was a transient phenomenon. You said they sort of returned back to baseline for the most, the majority of cases. Um, but it's something that probably deserves further study in the idiopathic hypersomnia population. And then in terms of its onset causing idiopathic hypersomnia, the issue is idiopathic implies that there is no other cause. And so, yeah. um, you know, I think there's a whole entity of long COVID um, or, you know, this sort of post-infectious syndrome that's associated with COVID with hypersomnia, fatigue, um, certainly being a very prominent component. And, and we sort of think of that as a separate entity from idiopathic. Yeah. Um, one question here, and um, one of my friends actually wrote uh, part of his dissertation on, on something similar, but in, have you heard of IH diagnosis being downgraded to hypersomnolence due to insufficient sleep when eight to 11 hours per day was... Um, inconsistent sleep times causing brain fog and sleepiness during the day. And, and as I understand it, hypersomnolence disorder is, you know, a, a DSM diagnosis versus an ICSD diagnosis. But if, specifically, have you seen it downgraded or, or changed? Uh, just based off long sleep duration? I, I believe that was. Cheryl, if you could yeah. provide more context, that would be great in the chat. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that... Um... So, you know, the, there's there's another condition um, of long sleep duration, you know, essentially. And essentially, long sleep duration is a, a condition that's in the International Classification of Sleep Disorders as well, where people require more sleep than typical. So um, 11 hours or 10, 11 hours or something like that but they, they feel great if they get it, right? And so that's the difference between idiopathic hypersomnia and that condition is that people with idiopathic hypersomnia, despite getting the long sleep duration, still have significant daytime sleepiness, fatigue, and all the related symptoms we talked about. 
The issue is that, you know, who can really sleep 11 hours every day <laughs> and feel great? You know, that's just not something most society is built for. And so as a result, long sleep duration patients oftentimes have curtailed sleep and are functioning like a partially sleep deprived group. The, the, but, you know, I think that's a separate issue is the management. But, you know, if we get patients who say like over the summer, I was able to sleep as much as I wanted and I felt great. And now I'm back in school and now I'm failing again. Like that suggests more of the long sleep duration. So I don't know if that was a long-winded answer that may have covered that answer, but um, that, I think that's what they might be getting at. Yeah, I agree. Um, I had one question too, and I'm going to ask for one other question after this so we can let Dr. Maskey get back to, um, to, to her personal life. But um, one question was about POTS. Is there a preferred medication option if, if stimulants are giving trouble? Um, and then I will open it up for one last best rapid fire question in there in the chat, and then we will transition so you can get back home. Um, a preferred treatment for POTS, I'm not an autonomic expert, but you know, there um, sometimes salt is actually a useful thing. Um, and then stimulants, at least our autonomic group doesn't have a problem with it as long as it's not increasing the tachycardia above a certain amount. So I, I kind of make that recommendation with their um, assistance. Um, a lot of the patients come back on flumazenil, uh, I'm sorry, not flumazenil, flu flugicortisone um, to sort of help with POTS management. And I think, you know, that might be more specific to the POTS, but it's not going to be necessarily the treatment for the daytime sleepiness and fatigue. So my only um, counseling there is, you know, to have the prescribers talk to each other and provide very clear blood pressure and heart rate parameters. Um, I have patients who use things like Acta watches or Fitbits or their Apple watches to kind of stay within those parameters if that's something affordable to them, um, because it can, you know, they can have additive effects on, on autonomic function for sure. Um, and then just one last quick question. Um, it, is there any data on later onset of IH? I don't have, didn't have symptoms until I was in my fifties. I'm 70 now. And I know there's some, you know, I think it's binaural pattern in terms of narcolepsy, but I'd be interested to hear what that looks like for IH. Yeah. I mean, I'm in pediatrics, so I don't sort of see that in my clinical population. Um, again, I would say it's something that probably could be studied in the um, hypersomnia registry and see if people are reporting it more frequently or based on billing data. I think that would be ways of getting at it. Thank you so much for your time. I just, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for, for coming out on a Monday night um, and, and dedicating this this time and energy to the, the conversation. Claire, would you like to say anything to Dr. Maskey as we're finishing up? Yes, thank you. As always, thank you. Um, the value of your, um, everything you say is just so helpful to, and many of the people here are new to the community, new to the meetings and new to, I mean, sometimes I'm sure you might feel like, well, I said this, you know, six months ago, but not at all. Um, absolutely valuable information. And um, I can on also invite everyone to be on CP because Dr. Maskey will be hopefully presenting there. So you'll hear from her again this year in Houston. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me, guys.